Hey everybody, it's Bunny. You guys, I feel like it's not often that I feel legitimately nervous for a video that I'm about to record. Uh, keeps dying, glitching, everything. Like I am like concerned to proceed, like sweaty hands, freaking out. Um, Cause I do feel like this is a story that I've never fully explained to you guys. And I feel like it comes off as I'm hiding things from you guys or I'm being secretive or I'm not letting you in on my thoughts and on my feelings. But really what it is, is I feel like pure fear and superstition. And sometimes when things bother me really badly or scare me, I kind of just lock it in and shut it out, I guess is a good way to say it. And I feel like if you watched Shane and I's like the final piece of the collab when we were in Uncommon Objects and that growling noise played, I think that's what scared me so much is because I almost feel like I've been running away from one particular thing for so many years. And I thought in that moment, I was like, oh my God, like, has it finally caught up with me. And so I never wanted to continue ghost hunting. And so this was back before um, Dogman and I started dating again. And he had just had an accident, like he had fallen out of a tree and like, had kind of like collapsed one lung and had to have surgery and like his wrist was shattered and like all this really bad stuff had happened. Um, and so he had this accident and literally the next day I called him because I had a dream where like he had gotten injured and it was so weird because we hadn't talked in months and I had this bad dream and I called him and I was like, are you okay? Um, you know, and he was like, why? Like, why would you think I'm not okay? And then like, we had a discussion on the phone. I found out that he had like fallen out of his tree and was like really hurt. He had kind of described like the night that he fell out of this tree and had this accident. Like he described seeing a shadowy figure, but it was like kind of something like that he wasn't hundred percent sure of. The house that he was living at, at, at the time, like I had visited a lot. I had stayed over a lot when we had first started dating. And I had had some weird experiences in that house before. Uh, there's actually this one story that we would always tell um, where if you would leave a radio on in inside of this house and you would like leave it on like a rock station or a pop station or whatever, and you would leave the radio on and leave the house and you would come back and the radio would always be flipped to either a Christian station or like a country station. It was between those two, like you kind of never knew what you were gonna get. Um, so we had just had like weird feelings that I would get sometimes if I was in particular rooms of this house, it would be the feeling of like being watched and like sometimes to such a frightening level where I would feel like I've got to get out of this room. Like it's, it's not only like the feeling of being watched, but like the feeling that I shouldn't be here and I need to get away. <laughs> Um, you know, so there were just like always little things that would happen that would make you feel unsettled, uncomfortable. We would always stay on the second story. So like heat rises, usually like the second story of a house is always like a little bit warmer. Um, and it would be like just really like really hot or really cold in seasons in Texas where that shouldn't make any sense. So, you know, it was just like little things like that, but it had been a while since I had visited this house or thought about any of these experiences. And it had certainly been forever since I had stayed over or anything like that. So I kind of just like, wasn't really thinking about that. And so we were just like sitting, talking and um you know and i was just trying to ask i was like well how did you like possibly like fall out of this tree like what what was going on and then he like had brought up this like shadow figure kind of thing um and then you know my curiosity was peaked just like kind of thinking about ghost all the time and so I was like well how would you feel if I like brought over my spirit box which if you guys really remember my old videos it's like a little radio that somebody you know hacks so that the tuner doesn't work and what it does is it just rapidly cycles through channels but it won't ever really tune and stop on one channel so you can use it when you're ghost hunting to ask questions that you would want to ask you know a ghost or a spirit and they will manipulate the radio signal or like catch words that are even being said somewhere on the radio 
and then you'll be able to like listen back. Sometimes you can hear it live and sometimes you have to like listen back to the footage to get, you know, a response or the answer you're looking for. Doesn't work every time, but that's, um, and so I was just saying like, hey, it might be kind of fun. Like, you know, and I, I bet I was thinking at the time, like, oh, maybe I'll make a YouTube video out of it um, and just kind of like record and kind of like investigate and, you know, see what we could find. And so I had come back like a couple of days later, like with, you know, all of my equipment at the time, like totally prepared to do this. And I was like, really ready. I was like excited. I was like, let's do this. Maybe, honestly, it was going to be like one of the first investigations that I ever did where it wasn't coming from like a historical point because, you know, I'm sure if you guys had like watched my older videos, like I would tell like a historical story and then I would try and ask questions that were like pertinent to, you know, that story or the people that I was talking about. But I had never really like just gone into somebody's house and be like, is there anybody out there? Um, and so I was just, I feel like I was just like really excited, but like not scared at the moment. Um, and so, you know, we were just like sitting on the couch talking because like I was just gonna go up there completely alone in the dark by myself. I didn't, you know, really ever have anybody that went on investigations with me and Dogman couldn't get up the stairs. And so I was just gonna go up by myself. Um, and so I feel like we were just talking and I was saying like, oh, I'm gonna do this, this and that. I kept seeing something out of the peripheral of my vision because like where the sofa was placed was like kind of like a little bit off to the side of the staircase. And so I kept like seeing something and I feel like it was just like a totally shocking and terrifying moment and, and once again like I know some of you guys are gonna be like this doesn't sound scary at all I feel like it's just something that like if you were there and if you saw it when you're in the presence of something that feels like really negative and really terrifying it's like a feeling of almost having like the wind knocked out of you it's like you just feel like you like can't breathe and so like I had seen this like kind of shadow thing. Like I literally just thought like, oh, maybe somebody else is upstairs right now. Something is creating a shadow. Like I finally just turned over to be like, what is it? Um, and what I saw was the most hulking, looming, like unnaturally tall shadow figure I've ever seen in my life. I do feel like shadow figures necessarily aren't always bad and they definitely didn't always frighten me. I feel like I told you guys my favorite ghost story of all time was when I saw a shadow figure at Moon River Brewing Company in Savannah, Georgia. And that one was really cool to see. I didn't feel anything negative from that one, but this one was completely the opposite. It felt like I was looking at something that I should not be looking at. And I feel like it was just kind of like looming and lurching forward. Like it almost looked like it was coming down the stairs. And it was just like, it felt so negative to me. And I feel like I just combined it in my mind, you know, with like, oh, like he just like had this like terrible accident and said he like saw some like kind of shadowy figure perhaps. And now here we are. It felt like something really bad would happen if I tried to provoke this thing, communicate with this thing. It was as if like all of the experiences that I'd had in this house over all these years, like culminated into one moment that just was like flashing with a big red sign, like danger, danger, danger. And I feel like I got out of there pretty quick that night and I was like, um, okay, never mind. Great to see you. Talk to you later. There definitely are a lot of times in my life that I miss investigating ghosts and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I wish I could do that again. Uh, but then I just always have that little voice in my head that's like, wait, <laughs> stop. Maybe not. Maybe it's not a good idea. All right. So, um, I guess I'll be a little indulgent with my story. I'll just take my time with it. Because <laughs> whenever I talk to people about supernatural things, or they ask me anything about it, I always say I'm a skeptic. And then people get a little defensive because I think they misunderstand that, that skepticism to me doesn't mean that I'm not a believer because I absolutely believe in the inexplicable or inscrutable forces. I'm just very cautious to be aware of the ways it's easy to be fooled. And that's really what it is. It's not that I'm sure that I know everything or that I'm so certain that I'm 
solid in reality, it's the opposite, that I'm aware of how easy it is for me to be fooled, and I think for anybody, because I feel like the life is just a slippery thing. Consciousness is this slippery, inscrutable thing, naturally, that I have no idea how it works. As far as I understand, nobody does. I'll play with this for a second. This it's is a comforting thing. No, no, this is, this is a fun thing I like to do. Like, somebody taught me this, but if you close your eyes and you've got a solid object, you know, something with a little length to it, and you poke surfaces, <laughs> you can tell what it is. You can almost feel it. You can feel the plastic or the wood. You can tell that it's, well, I was going to say porcelain, but glass. Still, something that's got a kind of breakable quality. You can almost feel it, but I don't have nerves at the tip of this stick. You know, how, how do I feel that? How am I, how am I internalizing that? I can't explain it, you know, because consciousness is a slippery thing. And uh, it's very possible to see things that aren't there, to feel things that aren't there. It's easy, there's nothing to be ashamed in. You know, we've all, I think everybody's seen something for a moment that they looked at, and for a flash, it was something that it absolutely turned out not to be. It startled them, you know, uh, look at it. It's something that's not, you know, with the wrong set of eyes or the right set of mind, frame of mind. You know, you can see something that's not there. It's easy to be fooled. And that's why, even if I see something that chills me to the bone, I'm a little hesitant. There's still a little voice that says, ah, uh, you know, give it a minute. And there's a memory I have when I'm a little kid, not quite in elementary school. And I lived in the old part of town where the boughs of the trees hang over the streets and there's big oaks and everybody's yards and the forest runs right up to the houses. And at the end of the street, there's a cul-de-sac completely encircled by the forest, except for where the road is. And that forest might as well have been the edge of the world to me. It's thick, it's deep, and there's a street lamp it glows a dim orange light and a hum that's steady. <laughs> Except for it would seem that whenever anybody would walk under that light, it would flicker. It would always hum steady at a distance, and I remember the walk coming up to it, walking down the street, watching the light watching for it to flicker, and it would never flicker, seemingly, you know, in my memory, until I'd get under it. And neighborhood kids would all get together, they'd congregate at this cul-de-sac and get under the light, and they'd ask it questions and see if it would flash. And that's not really the important part, except for just the way that eerie light and mysterious light lit the forest it might as well have been the edge of the world because this was an age to me when I had no concept of the town's layout. I had no concept of maps or places or where I was. When I went on summer vacation with my family, all I knew is you turn left on the main drive of town to get to my Aunt Judy in Florida. Keep on going that way. That's how you get to Florida. That's how I thought of it as a kid. I had no idea of roads. I just knew the roads I knew, like my own, and anything out of there might as well have been the edge of the world. And I remember my family going out to eat at night and I'd watch down the street and I could see that dim orange glow lighting the forest and it awakening this like primal fear in me for some reason. I'd hurry between the car to the house, in the house. If I was trying to get in the car, I'd be anxious to get inside the car. Once I was in, I felt safe. We'd drive to the restaurant, wherever we were going, come back home, 
get out of the car and hurry in the house because I could imagine all kinds of terrible things in that forest that I couldn't put names on. I'd imagine ogres or trolls, or ghosts, monsters, wolves. I could imagine all kinds of things sitting out there. And uh, my very best friend lived in the last house on the block, right by that lamp at the end of the street. And it was a time when my mother had been diagnosed with cancer and she was having her kidney taken out. And the idea of the surgery was frightening to me because the anticipation of it, that a time when somebody was going to be away from you and during which something beyond your knowing, beyond your control, that you couldn't see and couldn't predict, could take them away forever. As far as I knew, the surgery could be the end of it. So I thought that if I got past that day, all was going to be well. But waiting for it, there was a great deal of uncertainty in my mind as a child that I just I think I was more fearful at this age than uh, I would have been otherwise. So I was visiting my friend down by the spooky woods with the parent that's maybe passing in my mind. So I'm already a little insecure in the edges of my world. And we used to eat dinner about eight o'clock. I have to leave my friend's house for dinner time. Here most families eat around like five or six. We ate around eight o'clock, so it's good and dark. Sun is down for a while by the time I'm leaving. I gotta go by the forest. I gotta walk past that forest that I'd run from just my car in the driveway to my house. So I'm getting ready to do the sprint to get down to my home. And I see this figure in the road that's ahead of me. It's clear as day. There's a form, it's a person. They're walking. I thought it was just somebody out jogging or taking a walk. You'd have people walking their animals. Um, just how it was in the neighborhood, every neighborhood. And as clear as it was that it was a person, I couldn't really make out any details on him. And it was kind of a shrouded figure. It's almost like they had a hood on. And in my mind, it clicked that this was a shrouded figure like death. And it was walking towards my house. And I was behind it. And I remember being afraid to get in front of it. That I thought I had to trail it and stay behind it. And thinking that I was going to be embarrassed if it was just somebody walking and I just misunderstood it or missaw it. And I was trying to get my thoughts together. I was trying to say, just wait a minute. It's not what you think it is. And I kept walking because it stopped. I didn't want to be a freak. It wasn't looking at me. It was just stopping. I was apprehensive of it, but I didn't want to weird out one of my neighbors by acting sketched out. So I just kept walking and there was nobody there. I walked right through him, right past him. I went on home. I think I told my parents. My mother was fine. She had the surgery, she had her kidney out, she recovered, she's been in remission for years. Everything's fine. No malicious force, no, you know, supernatural ill will. But it was something that when I looked at it with my eyes, it was enough to stop me and make me reconsider what I was doing and make me reassess the situation as if it was a physical certainty. And I was sure I saw it. But am I just misremembering it? Did I know what I was looking at? I have no idea. It certainly was immaterial, you know, both physically and in terms of consequence. So I have no answers. It's just inexplicable phenomenon. 
So I've actually never been a believer in ghosts and I'm now in a relationship with somebody that is a firm believer in ghosts. And I think I had never been a believer because I've never had something in my life that was really crazy to make me think, oh, whoa, this is something that I need to pay attention to. But when I did start uh, living with Shane, weird stuff did start to happen. When he would be away from the house and it would just be me at night, I'd be sitting in the family room and I'd hear footsteps from the office, like very clear, loud footsteps that sounded like another person was in the house just walking around in the office and I'd run over to the office and nobody would be there. And then I would, would feel like I'd hear them in the kitchen or upstairs, but nobody would ever be there. So it is kind of spooky, but I don't think too much about it. And I feel like if it is a ghost, it's probably a nice ghost because it's not trying to harm me. Me and my dog, Una, we were up in the bedroom and I just felt a very weird presence in the room. And I look over and the dog was just dead set in the direction of where I felt the presence just dead on staring and it really spooked me out. So I guess you could say that I'm a believer, but I'm also a skeptic because every time we go to a haunted location, I'm never feeling as though there's ghosts or that it's super haunted or super spooked. I guess I am open to experiencing, but generally speaking, I'm a pretty close-minded person when it comes to ghosts, so I don't think they want to enter my life to begin with. I think the ghosts or unnatural spirits want to attach themselves to somebody that's very available for them or needing something else in their life, and I'm pretty closed off to that. So, I don't even know where to start <laughs> because it's a lot. Um, and I haven't really talked about it that much. I mean, I've talked about it a lot on my channel about my like experiences with ghosts and stuff, but I've never fully got into the backstory. So when I was a kid, uh, we were really religious. I mean, there was paintings of Jesus and Mary and Bibles everywhere, crosses everywhere. My grandma had this like bleeding crucifix hanging right over her bed, like her entire life. And I never thought anything of it. Like it wasn't weird to me, I was used to it. When things would happen when I was a kid, I wouldn't think that it was a ghost or anything like that because my mom would just tell me that it was, you know, God or an angel or something. One, I remember uh, I was laying in bed and I think I might've been around 10, I don't remember, nine or 10. And it was my birthday and I had a really bad birthday and I was sad and I was trying to fall asleep and I felt like nails on my back. Like 100% I felt somebody put their nails on my back. So I thought it was my mom and I turned around and it wasn't. So I freaked out, I ran to her bedroom, I got on her bed and I said, oh my God, I felt nails on my back. And my mom said, oh, that was your guardian angel. And I said, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Looking back, uh, I don't know what that was, but it definitely didn't feel like an angel. And stuff like that would happen a lot. I would see faces outside of my window. I would see figures in my house. I would see things all the time. And my mom would even tell me about, you know, some of the scary stuff she saw when she was my age, like demonic stuff. And I would just think it was God or angels or whatever. And then when I got older, I realized it probably wasn't. When I really, for the first time, realized that it could have been like ghosts was when I was laying in bed and my grandma had died and a while back and I saw her standing in my closet and it was her. It was her face, it was her outfit, it was everything. And it wasn't even that late, I wasn't asleep, it was real. Ever since that moment, I was like, oh my God. Like maybe all of the stuff that I saw when I was a kid was real, maybe that wasn't just, <laughs> I don't know. After I saw my grandma, I went to a medium who was like a very reputable medium. She solved murders, she worked with the FBI. She didn't really do like at home cases, like she wasn't that type of medium, but she did it for me because she was a family friend. When I met with her, she told me that everything I experienced when I was a kid was not angels or demons or any of that, it was ghosts. And that ghosts had been around me since I was born. At that moment in my life, I was the most depressed I've ever been. 
I was thinking about suicide and things that like <laughs> up dark stuff. I didn't tell her that. And she said that standing right next to me was my uncle who had killed himself when I was younger. And my uncle was telling me not to do it. I never told anybody that I had an uncle who killed himself. Never told anybody that. There's no way she could have known that. She was a family friend because I was in a relationship. Like she wasn't a part of that side of my family. And she knew his name and how he did it and everything. Since that moment, like, I've just been having more and more experiences. And every time I have an experience, it seems like it makes my life better. Like it makes me closer to people. I feel closer to my boyfriend. I feel closer to my friends. We have fun haunted experiences and we hear things and see things and I can open them up to it. And now I'm not even scared of it. I feel like my like weird connection to ghosts has got me to where I am and also has led me to really cool people like Bonnie because I know she loves ghosts and I have a lot of them. All right, so I feel like when it comes to ghosts and spirits and everything, it's kind of interesting because my mind that I naturally have, it wouldn't be the mind to think that, uh, that ghosts were like real and everything, right? Just because, I don't know, I guess I just don't really think that much about spirits and stuff, but um, it's almost like, I have to believe in ghosts because of some of the experiences that I had um, as a kid and sometimes currently. One of the craziest ghost stories that I have among a lot of things, because I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, which was the South where there's a lot of spirits and spirit activity. It's this really spooky place. <laughs> One of the most like ghost affirming things, if that's a phrase <laughs> that ever happened, was my dad bought this old Victorian, uh, sort of like a, a house um, that was built in like, 19, you know, 12 or something. And he turned it into a day spa called Eden Day Spa in Memphis, Tennessee. It was so wild because, I'll make a very long story short, but when my dad showed up to meet the realtor when he was figuring out if he was gonna buy the place, he saw a woman up in the window and uh, she was wearing sort of like a white um, sleeping gown, <laughs> which he thought was very strange. But he didn't question it. He waved to her and said like, hey, I'm here, thinking it was the realtor to show him the house. And uh, she just walked to the other window <laughs> And he was like, oh, that was strange. Uh, and the realtor showed up and uh, he said, hey, there's someone in your house. I don't mean to alarm you because my dad used to be a police officer. He's like, it's not a big deal. I'll go in and like check out the place. And she was like, there's no one in that house. It's, you know, it's just me. I'm the only one with the keys. We have a security system in there. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to like scare you, but there's someone in the house. And there wasn't anyone in the house. They went in, there was no one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the realtor was very strange about it, whatever. But uh, he did end up buying the place. And that set off the crazy sequence of events uh, in my dad's life and my life and everything and it was wild and my dad when he turned it into this Eden Day Spa he went over to the neighbor's house to introduce himself and it was a bunch of old women that owned this realtor business and they asked him like oh have you seen uh, Miss Dudley in the house and he was like I'm sorry <laughs> and they were like Miss Dudley she you know she used to live there and she passed away about 14 years ago she died in that house like with her husband and everything and we see her sometimes in the window and have you seen her and my dad was just like because he didn't want to sound like a crazy person. He's like, oh my God, right? So uh, there was a spirit in that house called Mrs. Dudley and the things that she did was amazing. And I'll get to my own personal experience, but she would uh, move entire washing machines <laughs> in front of the door. She would, uh, you know, turn books upside down when they were in their shelves. My dad would come in in the morning and have to reorganize the place because all the books would be like set out on the table, perfectly lined up. It was insane. But as a kid, I didn't really know what to think about this because there were people that worked there that ran out, quit, uh, contractors that would run out saying they'd never go into the place again. And I I always thought, eh, this is just hearsay, right? But uh, one time when I was in there, my dad ran down the street to get some oils and lotions and everything for the, the day spa business. And <laughs> he said, you know, just lock the place down, whatever, just, you know, if anyone calls, pick up, right? So I was just gonna be there for maybe 10 minutes while he was gone. And I heard someone coughing upstairs and there wasn't a, a, a like, there was nothing in my head that, that went, oh, that's spooky. <laughs> I just thought, oh, someone's here and I said like, go say hello, because I didn't know who it was, so I was like, oh, I'll just say hi to them, right? So um, this coughing was happening upstairs, and it sounded brutal. And I wanted to walk up and just offer them a glass of water. Hey, are you okay? What's going on up here? And so I start creeping up the stairs, you know, just stair by stair, and it's getting worse and worse, and I'm thinking this is an issue, and I didn't have a cell phone at the time, so I was freaking out, thinking, like, do I call 911? What do I do? <laughs> and uh, this coughing is getting worse, worse. I'm creeping up the stairs, and I turn the corner, 
and it just instantly stops. And it's just a beautiful empty bed with like rose petals on it because it was a day spa bed and breakfast thing, right? My heart just froze. <laughs> I froze up. I didn't know what to do. I mean, this cough was right by my ear practically before I rounded the corner and uh, I booked it out of there. <laughs> and I was waiting outside my dad pulled up in his truck and he was like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be in there. I was like, I'm not going in there again for a long time. <laughs> it was terrifying. Uh, and then we found out uh, later, about six months later, that the husband um, died of emphysema in that very room. He actually pulled his own plug, which was really dark um, because his wife had already passed away. So I probably heard him coughing, but, um, and I've had so many experiences since, but that was the one experience that never, never, never left me. And I don't think like it's an option for me to believe or not believe in ghosts because I'd be a fool to deny that experience. Yeah. All right, <laughs> I'll keep my story short and simple. So my friend Shane has the scariest house known to the human earth. Is that a thing? Human earth? All right, scariest place on earth. Me and my friend were staying there. Shane and Ryland decided they would go to Mexico without me. They didn't invite me. But <laughs> I decided that I would watch the dogs. So me and my friend were there watching the dogs and I was sleeping on the couch and there's always like weird noises in his house but I kind of just ignore them. So I was laying on the couch, it was the middle of the night. Uno, the dog, and no name the dog who doesn't bark at all. They will just keep barking at the windows. Window, like all the blinds are shut, there's nothing they could see. So all night I was up listening to these dogs bark and I hear someone like literally walk past me, go to the kitchen. I don't know like what kind of ghost appetites these ghosts have, but I guess it's heavy because he like poured a whole bowl of cereal, milk included, put the spoon in and I could like hear him chewing cereal. Like <laughs> I'm not like, no, I'm not even trying to be funny. He was eating cereal. To be honest, I think ghosts are selfish and I think they only like people when they're sad sometimes. Because when I'm happy, ghosts don't bother me, but when I'm sad, like, they really want to mess with you. Yeah, this ghost was munching on a whole bowl of cereal. And he never told me that, like, the ghost would pour cereal. But Uno and No Name Dog were just barking at the kitchen table while I could hear him pouring cereal. And I told Shane that and he was like, yeah, that happens all the time. I think he was mad that Shane was gone and that's why he was so, like, confused. I have a ghost named Angie, but I think that when I'm happy, she doesn't like to bother me because she like doesn't get a fix from it. Angie got pushed like off a mountain and murdered when she was like 20, I think. Yeah, she like doesn't bother me that much anymore. Yeah, now I'm on to Shane's ghost who like likes to eat cereal, which I can relate. <laughs> okay, and that's my ghost story. The end. <laughs>